There was this guy that Dipinder would play foosball with at Bain & Company during breaks between work. And Dipinder is a pretty competitive guy. When he sets his mind to something, he can accomplish quite a lot. But when it came to foosball, well, <laughs> this competitor was just better. Dipinder would lose and lose and lose to this guy, whose name was Pankaj. And one day during lunch, Pankaj happened to glance at Dipinder's computer screen, where he had opened Foodie Bay's Google Analytics page. He was watching the site traffic, hoping that there would be an uptick in the number of visitors. At that exact moment, during peak lunch hour, there were three. And Pankaj didn't pull any punches. He told Dipinder that this was a very low number. And of course, Dipinder knew this. He just kept looking at his computer screen, hoping that somebody, anybody would visit the site. And somebody did. <laughs> the number of visitors increased to four, then five, then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Foodie Bay's traffic had more than tripled in a single lunch hour. Dipinder couldn't believe it. That is, until he saw Pankaj smiling. He later found out that Pankaj had changed his G-Talk status to go check out foodiebay.com. And while this was just a friendly gesture on Pankaj's part, it made Dipinder realize something. Up until that point, Dipinder's startup journey had been lonely. He didn't have a co-founder, someone to bounce ideas off of, someone to build his business with. And so on that day, July 10th of 2008, Dipinder asked Pankaj if he wanted to join Foodiebay as his co-founder. And Pankaj said yes. Now, I think knowing what we know about this company today, how successful it's been, the fact that it's an international publicly traded empire of a business can distort our perspectives a bit. Because you gotta keep in mind here, Pankaj had no idea what he was signing up for. By saying yes to Dipinder, he was unwittingly giving away his 20s to this startup. When Dipinder asked him if he wanted to be his co-founder, Pankaj was just 22 years old. He graduated from IIT Delhi in 2007 and was recruited right away to join Bain and & Company. And the last thing he thought he'd end up doing with his time there was building a startup. But for the next 16 months while working at Bain, he and Dipinder would work tirelessly building Foodie Bay in the evenings, after work, and on weekends. And there was a sense of urgency here. They couldn't afford to slow down because 2008 was the year when food websites in India exploded. HungryBangalore.com, which later became Hungry Zone, was started just four months after Foodlit in July of 2006. Using this platform, users could order food online from 150 restaurants across Bengaluru and get it delivered to them. They were way ahead of their time. Then, a month after Hungry Bangalore was launched, Burp, a Mumbai-based startup, launched their website where you could discover restaurants, bars, cafes, and roadside stalls in cities across India. Next year, in October of 2007, home-cooked food delivery service Tasty Kana started operations in Pune. So at this point, there were at least four different companies in India's food tech space, but they were all operating out of different cities. And so it didn't really feel like a competitive market. That would change though in 2008, when three more prominent food tech websites were launched. Plan For Me, ByteQuest, and A Place To Dine, all of which were based out of Delhi. Suddenly, Dipinder and Pankaj had local competition. And while Foodie Bay still had its early mover advantage, they knew that they would need to move more quickly if they were going to stay ahead. Luckily, competition also resulted in attention. News media companies saw this wave of food websites and the power struggle between them as a story. And before 2008 was over, Foodie Bay was covered by NDTV, India Today, and Your Story. This was the publicity that they desperately needed. Customers, upon realizing that Foodie Bay existed, flocked to the site. This increase in traffic caught the attention of restaurants who began scanning their menus and uploading them to Foodie Bay in the hopes of reaching new customers. By the end of the year, more than 1,400 restaurants had uploaded their menus to the site, far more than Dipinder and his wife ever could have managed alone. And these were just restaurants in the Delhi NCR region. In 2009, Foodie Bay expanded their presence to two new cities, Mumbai and Kolkata, and launched a host of features to keep their platform competitive and fresh, too. 
These features included individual user accounts, ratings and reviews, personalized recommendations based on a user's location, and the ability to create lists of restaurants within a user's account. Finally, after more than three years of struggling, Dipinder's startup, his vision of bringing Indian restaurants online, was beginning to gain momentum. It was beginning to evolve, and Dipinder and Pankaj soon realized that they were going to need to evolve along with it. See, they had begun to stretch the limits of what they could accomplish while moonlighting. Bain & Company was slowing them down, and at this point, thanks in large part to Pankaj, they had broken even. They were covering their costs not with their salaries from consulting, but from Foodie Bay's revenue. See, Pankaj had taken it upon himself to lead Foodie Bay's marketing program by selling ad space on the website, both in the form of traditional banner ads and in the form of premium highlighted listings. And with more than 1 lakh visitors on the website every month, these ads were making the startup enough money for Dipinder and Pankaj to think about quitting their day jobs. In November of 2009, when Dipinder's wife secured a teaching job at the University of Delhi, he decided it was time. He submitted his letter of resignation at Bain & Company and channeled all of his attention into Foodie Bay. A few days later, Bunkaj did the same. They were now full-time entrepreneurs. This wasn't a side hustle anymore. And while they probably could have continued to bootstrap Foodie Bay, Dipinder and Bunkaj realized that they wanted to grow more quickly. Even in those early days, they envisioned Foodie Bay as a pan-India platform and a well-established brand around the world too. They also wanted to eclipse the competition and stop worrying about Burp or Hungry Zone overtaking them. And most importantly, they wanted to innovate. They wanted to go beyond just being a catalog of restaurants and their menus. In a blog post, Dipinder wrote that Foodie Bay wanted to offer their users more than just restaurant directory listings. As a product, they wanted to evolve into a recommendation engine that suggested the best places to order home delivery from or to dine out at. But of course, to do all of these things, Foodie Bay would need money capital, investors, they would need to raise funds. And so soon after quitting their jobs at Bain and & Company, Dipinder and Pankaj announced that they would be raising a million dollars, or 4.7 crore rupees at the time. Seven months later, in May of 2010, Dipinder got an email in his inbox from somebody at Nokri by the name of Sanjeev. Given that he hated dealing with salespeople, he ignored it. And so the email sat in Dipinder's inbox for a couple of days. Eventually, he got around to opening it and realized that he had been ignoring the founder of one of India's largest internet companies, Sanjeev Bikchandani. Sanjeev is the founder of InfoEdge, an Indian pure play internet company that by 2010 had spawned subsidiaries like Nokri.com, Jeevansati.com, 99acres.com, and Shiksha.com. Now, InfoEdge is based out of Noida, and Sanjeev had actually been using Foodie Bay for some time. He really enjoyed it. He was a customer, but in May of 2010, an interesting thought crossed his mind. Maybe he could become an investor. Dipinder quickly wrote out a response, sent it off to Sanjeev, and subsequently met up with him to discuss. Within 72 hours of this meeting, Sanjeev had agreed to invest a million dollars into Foodie Bay. That money came through in November of 2010. And unlike many seed stage investors, InfoEdge actually held onto their stake in the startup. When it went public in 2021, they owned upwards of 18% of the company and saw a 65x return on their original investments, which were made at a time when nobody else really believed in the startup. And I say investments, plural, because they actually led three more rounds of funding completely on their own before finally Sequoia Capital jumped into the startup's $35 million Series D round in November of 2013. See, back in 2010, this was uncharted territory. In fact, the term food tech wasn't even being used at this point. Foodie Bay and its competitors were being referred to as food guides. And well-known food tech platforms like Tiny Owl, Swiggy, and Uber Eats wouldn't be founded until a couple of years later, in 2014. The idea of a mobile-first logistics network of food delivery partners shuttling meals between restaurants and customers was far off on the horizon. And so any investor putting money into this space was taking a big gamble. Before 2013, no other investor saw the same potential that Sanjeev did. But that's not all that Sanjeev saw. In his preliminary conversations with Dipinder and Pankaj, Sanjeev asked an important question. Why Foodie Bay? 
Why the name? And of course, Dipinder walked him through the story of Foodlit, the struggles that he had faced while building that early iteration of the startup, and the numerology-based change that he made from Foodlit to Foodie Bay. But Sanjeev continued to voice concern. Firstly, he said that the first four letters of the startup's name were restrictive. If the startup ever tried to launch products or services outside of the food space, their customers might be confused. By having the word food in the name, they were pigeonholing themselves. And secondly, Sanjeev explained that having eBay as the last four letters of the company's name was a very precarious thing to do, because at any moment, eBay could send Foodie Bay a legal notice, forcing them to either suddenly change their name or risk entering into a legal battle with eBay, neither one of which were ideal scenarios. And so at the beginning of November of 2010, Dipinder and Pankaj started brainstorming. They wanted a name that was still related to food, but one that was also universal, something timeless and versatile. They settled on a modification of the word tomato, which is a word that most people are familiar with, even if they don't speak English. By adding a Z, they were injecting a bit of zing, a bit of character into the name. And five days before they were set to announce the change, eBay did send them a legal notice, solidifying their resolve to destroy all of the brand equity that they'd spent nearly three years building and start fresh with the name that the company is known by today, Zomato. <laughs>